Yeah. It's love. Okay. Yes. All right. So, thank you, Harald, and uh, welcome all to this presentation. This is uh, more scary for me than usual because I, I bet about a quarter of you know this topic much better than I do. Um, but uh, I'm on the stage. I have the microphone, so <laughs> that's that's how it works. Uh, the background for this presentation is I, I blame Mathieu. It, uh, seriously, I, I blame Mathieu. The, did any of you watch his um, presentation? He held it uh, a little less than a year ago. Uh, uh, and uh, also some of the, or maybe instead some of the more uh, updated versions that he presented at uh, a number of conferences. And also another source of inspiration is, of course, Mike Acton's absolutely wonderful keynote from CppCon 2014. Can you believe it's been 10 years? If you haven't watched it, watch it. It's really, really, really good. He hates C++. <laughs> he hates C++. Yeah, I, 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 have a, I, I believe that if, in the unlikely event that Mike Acton would watch this talk, he would not be pleased. Uh, but but he, he is an inspiration nonetheless. So what this is about is data layout. And uh, Mike Acton talks a lot about this. And, and it's about making good use of the memory bandwidth. So a, a typical thing is if you have this, uh, it's a struct of uh, four numbers and you have them in a contiguous store and in a vector and say you search for something uh, some value of some some entry where d has a specific value so you start start reading what happens is that the the way the hardware works is that you don't read a single byte you you read a, a cache line a cache line is typically today so on today's cpu 64 bytes so you read that, and then you you look at this value and say, ah, no, it's not that one, uh, or that one, no, it's not that one. And then you do another read, uh, is it that one? No, it's not that one, or no, it's not that one. Note that we have used one quarter of, of the memory that we have read. Three quarters is just waste. So finally, we find the value that we want, and now we can do something with uh, x, y, and z. This is, uh, it, it's simple to write the program this way, of course, but it wastes the memory bandwidth. So what Mike Acton was talking about, and definitely Mathieu also talked about in, in his presentation, is that you can instead organize your data like this. So here we have four different vectors, one with all the x's, one with all the y's, one with all the z's, one with all the d's. So now we, we are searching for a specific d. We read this one, check, no, 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 no. And the thing is, uh, accessing something that is in the, in the L1 cache is uh, approximately for free. It's super cheap. So in this case, the first read was expensive. The other seven was just for free. And then we do another one. Is it that one? Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, now we got it. So now we can look at a, a x, y, and z and do what we want to. Uh, in this example, it doesn't really look that impressive. But say that we had to search for 200 Ds before we found the, the right one. Then there's a, there's a huge difference. In, uh, in how efficient we are with the memory bandwidth. And another thing that also helps this more is that CPUs today have, have prefetchers that they, they recognize that you are doing sequential accesses in, in a known address stride. Going to a higher address, a higher address, a higher address. It sees a pattern and says, I bet you're going to read this memory too. So it starts preloading it, so you already have it, which makes the, the wait time for the next access to be, in best case, nothing because it's already read, but in worst case, low. 
because the, the read started before you got there. But the problem is that using the latter uh, kind of, of um, architecture is not very nice. So I'll show you. Uh, so I have a program, a simple program. Uh, it, it, it reads, it populates a vector with uh, a large number of values. I'm using a ridiculously large number just to make it obvious that we have a ton of cache misses. Uh, and then we just loop searching for something and if if that is found then we take the the last element in the vector and move it to to the spot that we have and then we drop the last element and we just keep doing this so it's, a, it's a nonsense workload but just an example uh. So can do this. I'm, I'm using uh, Clang for for all the examples here. Uh, you know, Clang 18. Um, you can you can use other compilers. You would get essentially the same result in a way. Uh, so if we look at this one, this program takes not very long time, but it. it Two and a half seconds, roughly. Uh, two and a half billion cache references. Okay, so let's compare this with the struct of vectors, where we do the same thing, but we have a struct S here that has a vector of x's, a vector of y's, z's, and d's. Uh, our drop if function is not quite as nice. Search for the value. If it is found, then move the elements from the individual vectors. Uh, otherwise, keep keep going. Uh, and the same. We start by reserving each of them, populating each of the vector vectors, and uh, do this do this loop. The, the same criteria. The difference here is that the, there is no such thing as the value of uh, x, y, z, and d. So what we have to do is to uh, work, call, call our lambda with the index and say, where, where are we? So that it can index the, the different uh, vectors to, to find if we, uh, if we want to do what, whatever it is. Uh, So we try that one instead. Okay, 2.2 seconds. It's uh, it's faster. <coughs> we see it's difficult to see here now. We had two and a half billion cache references compared to 640 million. That is substantial. Uh, and uh, the rest, well, the cycles are of course different, uh, 40 million branches, yeah, the, the rest are more or less the same, but it, substantially fewer memory accesses, and uh, speed is it's faster, it's definitely faster. So what we can see that by using this struct of vectors layout for our data. We have way fewer memory accesses. We have somewhat f somewhat fewer cache misses. Maybe way fewer was exaggerated. Uh, slightly, ever so slightly fewer instructions. And it's faster, notably. 2.5 compared to 2.2 seconds. It's, uh, it's notable. And absolutely horrible. Th this is the worst code ever. You, you don't want to do that. So after having watched uh, Mathieu's talk, I started thinking, can we 
can we do this in some way that is easier to work with and keep the performance? It should be possible. It really should be possible. So my thought is um, t tuple is cool. Tuple is really cool. So I, I, I say that I, I have a table of types t's. And the way we implement this is that all these vectors are a tuple of vectors of t's. And uh, I have a row type that is a tuple of references to t's. So now the angle bracket operator to, to do a lookup in the table is just uh, create references to the ith element in each of the columns. So we can write, then write some member functions, like push back, pop back, uh, uh, get the last one, reserve empty size, things that are good to have. And now our drop if function can look more like normal. You, you just say, hey, walk through all the indexes, see if, does the predicate match this, uh, the values in this uh, row? And if so, move it. In, in move the last element into that slot and, and pop the last one, shrink the vectors or the shrink the table rather. Otherwise, go for the next. So we can now write our criteria here based on the values. We the the function the the lambda here will be called with uh, a row that is a tuple of references to t's. And we can do uh, destructuring to get the x, y, z, and d inside it. Sorry. Uh, and do a comparison. So this, is, this reads more like normal code. So let's, let's try this one. So we have the table, I have all the other functions, pushback, uh, invoke, you, you see a pattern here. It's all just stood get of all the columns uh, and uh, read the uh, wh whatever it is that, that, you, that you need. Get the uh, offset, element at the offset, etc. So it's a, it's a bit repetitive, but it's hidden in a, a simple uh, class template. And uh, drop if uh, exactly as before, and the code. It's uh, the population is not that great, but it's it's not horrible. So how does this fare then? All right. 641,640, Same number of cash misses, roughly 40 million compared to 45 million. Okay, fewer instructions. I wonder why. I honestly don't know. Uh, and way fewer. CPU cycle, so one and a half second instead of 2.2. Uh, I do know that the difference is caused by the previous example uh, suffering from pipeline stalls, but I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at why it gets pipeline stalls. I'm just happy that a fairly small amount of code made this actually possible to work with. So. I had to make my success on matter here. <laughs> and uh, this, this actually made me happy enough to write a, a, an abstract for a, a conference presentation. And somehow it was accepted. So now I just had to do something. And here you are. So we can see that the ergonomics of working with this is roughly the same as with the vector of structs. Not quite, but thereabout. And the performance is the same, actually better than with structure vectors because of this uh, pipeline stall thing. But what I want, I, I, I want to aim higher. 
I want to have something that I can use easily the, to, for example, have a stable row ID so that if I, if I store an element, I can, I can look it up by a key. And I want uh, an iterator interface so that I can just use my table.begin.end, use it with uh, ranges, which is awesome. And on top of that, I also want a convenient way to look at only some of the columns, because I don't always want to look at every single column when I'm searching for some when I'm iterating and say search for the column where D has this value and Z has that value and I don't care about the other about the rest. And I want a convenient way to call functions with the selected elements. Now there are different ways that you can achieve this. Um, one one way is uh, to, to just like I, I mentioned, you have your uh, vectors of um, the different values, and the, the interesting thing is this uh, stable row ID thing. Uh, you can say that if if you remove an entry, you just mark that row as being unused, uh, which means that it, iteration becomes a little bit tricky because you, you move the values and then you have to say, oh, there's nothing here, and then you move to the next, and oh, no, nothing here, and you keep going. Uh, but it, it means that having a stable ID is trivial. It's just the offset in, 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 the, in the, all the columns. Uh, this is a data structure that uh, was called colony and was aimed for standardization in the C++ standard library. And then for some reason it was uh, renamed to Hive and was aimed for uh, inclusion in the standard library and then seem to have died. I don't know why. Uh, another way of doing this is uh, what I showed you earlier and say that no I, I'm not having I'm not having the data have a stable position. When you erase something you move the last entry into that slot. Uh, the advantage of that is that iteration will always be in contiguous memory. You will never have to check it if is this row unused, do I have to skip it? You, you just blaze through, which is uh, very good for, uh, for vectorization. Uh, but that comes at a cost. Because how, how do we get a stable row ID then? Well, as with everything in computer science, you add another level of indirection. So what we can do is like this. We I have the, in this case, two columns of, of data and I have an index. So if I want to erase number three, three is, uh, has a, also this stable ID of three. But I, when I erase that, I take the eight and move it there. Uh, the eyes, I mean, sorry. And the eyes have the stable ID of eight. So you fix that by in the index writing, no, it's three because it's, it's now stored on offset three in the data columns. And then we mark this uh, as available. So when we want to look up row ID eight, we see in the index that, yeah, that is stored on offset three. So we can read it. An engineering trade-off. This means that especially removal and uh, to some degree uh, insertion is more elaborate, uh, but it means that uh, iteration is super fast because everything is in contiguous memory. And also we need a reverse index because if we search for something and we find the I, and I want to be able to know what is the row ID of this thing that I just found, I can look at the reverse index and say it's eight because the reverse index and the index are always pointing to each other. So now if I want to insert a new element, in insert k, we know that it, it must go into 8 because insertion is always adding at the tail, at the highest possible place. So we add it there, we write 3 there because 3 was what, uh, what was available. 
uh, update this uh, index at position 3 with 8, because that is where it is now. So if I now want to look up uh, look up k, I know that its row ID is 3, 3 is stored in offset 8, and we, we get the, the address. So it's a, it's a bit of gymnastics with this uh, index and, and the reverse index. Uh, I did have to resort to uh, to fuzzing to get that right. Uh, it's uh, absolutely non-trivial, but it works. So by having this, I can now just change my uh, operator angle brackets to take a, a row ID instead. And to get the offset, I just do this uh, extra lookup. And the rest is just like it used to be with the lookup with, uh, with the index. So we can add some more pushback. It gives us the, the row ID so that we can keep something. Uh, erase takes row ID. We can ask it, do you have this row ID? So now you can write code like, like this. Where you push back a number of values, store the row IDs. If you erase something, then you can see at the, the last two lines that, no, it doesn't actually have those values. And otherwise, so the, the others that it does have with this extra indexing compared to the right values. So we're at home dry. I think that is nice. All right. So we have a stable row ID. And I think that's cool. So we crank up the successometer. But we're not there. This is, uh, this is not good enough. It, it, but it solves an important problem. What was the performance? Uh, what was the I, I will get back to you on that. Uh, but uh, it goes without saying that insertion and removal is slower, because you uh, juggle with the index and the reverse index. So before I go there, though, I want to look at having iterators. So since these, since these columns are now without any holes, they are in contiguous memory, this means that iteration, iteration in storage order is super fast. The prefetcher absolutely loves predictable access patterns in contiguous memory. Uh, and we can let the value type of, of our iterator be this uh, tuple of references, just as I showed you with, uh, with the angle bracket operator. Uh, and uh, if you're used to working with uh, ranges, then the zip view uses the same thing. So a zip view is what you get if you want to iterate over several ranges in parallel. So you say zip this range with this range, and then you get the, the, the tuple of references to the elements of each of the ranges. So what do we do? We create an iterator type. I'm choosing to store the pointer to the table and the offset in the table instead of having each of the iterators. Because if I would have each of the iterators, then I would have to do the, when, when we do, when we advance the, the iterator, I would have to compute the advancement of each of them. Here I just increment an offset. So it's less compute intensive. So operator star gives us this uh, uh, tuple of references. And operator equal equal to the sentinel value. Sentinel is what we use to denote the end. And sentinel doesn't hold anything. It's just a type that marks, hey, this is the end. And you say that an iterator is equal to the sentinel if the offset is the size of the table, right? Which means that for the table, our begin and end functions become absolutely trivial. We turn an iterator that points, starts with index 0 and points to this table, and end is just the, the sentinel that doesn't hold any value. So let's have a look at this. Oh, nay. 
wrong. Uh, that is one. So the table with the sentinel and, and the iterator type. This is actually a, a cool thing uh, that I wasn't aware of. Have you worked with uh, iterators in previous standards of C++ before 20? You, you, you had to define a number of types for them. The, what is the value type? We do that. What is the pointer type? What is the reference type? What is the iterator category? We don't have to do that anymore from 20 and forwards. It's enough to say what is the value type and the difference type, uh, and the libraries figure out the rest from the operators that you have available. So our operator star, operator plus plus, just increments the offset. Uh, operator equal equal, as I mentioned. So, yeah. Here is how fun the juggling with the indexes becomes with the, the erase from an iterator. It's a, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. Uh, but, but. So it's slower, 1.65 seconds compared to 1.57 uh, earlier. So we, we are definitely paying a cost for this indirection. Uh, but to not totally kill your interest in what I'm talking about, I made uh, another type of uh, the measurement uh, that is uh, perhaps more more interesting going forward so same table same uh, everything but I now have a workload where that is much heavier on iteration and not so heavy on insertion and removal so in this case we are searching for uh, for something that fulfills a predicate so in this case, we want to see if d equals some start value and z is 1. I can already use ranges. I'm doing filter. That is cool. So I have all my values, I filter them on the predicate, and then I uh, iterate over the found values and, and just print them. So, this doesn't mean very much now because we don't have that much to compare with, but, or actually, yeah, I can do that, sorry. There's more work here, it's slower, but yeah, okay, 11 seconds to filter through everything with that. So let's compare that with... <coughs> no, I don't have anything good to compare with. Sorry, <laughs> uh, the, my my mistake. Uh, but we we store this for future reference. Um, so now it would be nice, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, 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 when I'm I'm doing a find if say, and I find an element. What is the row ID for that? If I, in case I want to keep it for for later, I, I don't want to have the iterator because the iterator points to the offset and elements aren't stable in the offset; they move around. So, how do I do that? I tuple of references doesn't lend itself naturally to add uh, a new member to you. You, you could inherit from it and add some get uh, row ID function maybe uh, but then we lose uh, lose the structure binding the destructuring to, to get get ABC because it looks at the exact type not what it 
may have inherited from. But the standard library offers a way to implement the, the, the structuring for our own types. What we need to do is specialize std tuple size and std, std tuple element. Uh, the index is uh, l just, just like for tuple. What is the type of the idx uh, element of the tuple? And then we need to implement our own functions uh, get, just like you have get for, uh, for tuples. And then we're, at, then we're at home. So what do we need to do? Well, I change, uh, I write a new row type. I write my own row type. That ju just like the iterator, it's the same. It know which table you're referring to and the offset in the table. And uh, you do this double dance with the index to, to get the translate the row ID to to the offset, so you can return the the row to it. And uh, if you want to ask for the row ID for a row, you do the, the same thing, but with the reverse index. And uh, when you want to get the row, you just use just. Uh, the std get of, of the uh, of the tuple of vectors and the offset. And this is cool. C++ 26, magic uh, parameter pack indexing. It, it makes life easier. Before 26, you had to essentially write a, a recursive template that drops off i's until it gets to zero uh, and, and get it. This is cool. And then we do the specialization of tuple element and, and tuple size. Maybe you wanted to look at that a couple of seconds. <laughs> no, I already understand it. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. Yeah, so the tuple element, again, it just uses just the, the magic uh, uh, parameter pack indexing to get the ith type from the row and the tuple tuple size for a row is just the number of types that the row has. So not again. Unfortunately the standard library I'm using for the, these they do not have the uh, or rather the compiler uh, clang 18 does not implement um, parameter pack indexing, so I had to resort to this horrible recursion. Clang on uh, Clang trunk and GCC trunk does implement it, so li live on trunk, your life will be much easier. Uh, and then we have everything else is uh, the same as before. Uh, Like that. So what we can see now is what is the cost of this interaction to be able to find the index and use our own row type. Uh, there is one thing more actually about this uh, row type which uh, I will get to soon but that is uh, with a tuple of references, I, I'm never sure. I, I, I've seen that the compiler doesn't actually do the, the referencing unless you use the value, but do I want to trust that, that it does? We'll get to that soon. But uh, 11 seconds, 11, yeah, it's, it's the same. Okay, good. So we still have nice performance. So now I have an iterator interface and it does work with ranges. You saw that I did use uh, ranges filter here to, to get the, the values I wanted to find. And I, that is lovely, that is lovely. I, I can nerd out all, uh, about this a lot, it, it's uh, really cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm, 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 
I'm getting quite happy with where this is going. But I'm not there yet. So let's see about selecting columns. So with, with the current row type, we, we actually can select specific columns by, by using the get uh, function templates. So we can write something like this, uh, a, a function that takes a table of several types and I'm iterating over it and I just want to get the zeros and third column, the values from the zeros and third column. And I can do that. But it, it, it works, but it, it, it's not great ergonomics, let's say. So what can we do? So the thing that I thought of was, as usual, add another le level of indirection. In this case, the row knows which columns in the table it refers to. That is the C's. So when we want to get the ith element of the row, we look at the ith element of the columns that it re refers to. So if, if this row refers to columns 1, 3, 4, and 6, and I want to get index 2, then it's 1, 3, 4, that is the second one. So we we do this uh, extra thing. So so we can use this to get uh, a subset. Yes. In the original examples, you have the <coughs> x y z d. Yeah. Have you dropped the idea of name named names? Have I dropped the idea of columns. of named columns? Because uh, that's that where we started, right? The yeah. structure. Yep. We have names. Yep. Um, Yes. Uh, let me come back to you on that <laughs> one. <laughs> At that point, you're just switching yep. the column ID and the row ID, yep. and you could just do yep. this. Yep. So let me come back to that. Okay. Uh, for the moment, I'm not there. But this is uh, essentially like working with with tuples. Typically, is you say get 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 me the ith element of, of the of the tuple. But here I have uh, this extra indirection because it, we can refer to a subset. So now we have to change uh, the tuple size. Tuple size is how many columns does it refer to, and the tuple element have to do this indirection as before. So to to get the type the ith type. So now we can write a function, function template select, that takes the columns that I want, the, the, that is the i's in this case. So if it takes a, a row with, with columns c's, I want to get the, the i's columns of that row. Just like I showed you with, uh, with tuple element. So we can create a subset of, of the, the columns to refer to. Uh, but just just <laughs> creating a, a new row type with the uh, with the other column numbers. So now we can write drop if like this that we take a row R select column zero and two uh, destructure it to get their names x and z and, and return something. So a little bit better. Not hugely better, but a little bit better. Uh, but I want to select columns in a, in a complete iteration. I want to say blaze through all the elements in this, uh, in this table, but only on columns 0 and 2. So the way to do this that, that I thought of anyway is to have a new type, a, a range selector that takes some range that it refers to and the columns that it should have. Uh, and
I'm getting the, the underlying iterators, the, the iterators for the range that we're referring to by just uh, asking what, what, what do I get if I, if I call begin on that range, Th then that is the iterator. So then now I can create a new iterator by publicly inheriting from it, then I get operator equal equal and uh, plus plus etc for free. That is nice. And I create a new value type by calling the previous select that you just saw on the value type for the underlying iterator. A lot of indirections. Operator start to dereference this is get, get the underlying one, dereference it and call select on that row. So we get the, the numbers. And then a kind of silly gymnastics, but it, it's uh, more or less what I think we have to do. Uh, to be able to use operator pipe with this, I, I have this function select that d d returns a select selector maker that doesn't have any members at all other than this uh, friend operator pipe that actually makes the range selector, like so. So then, then, then we get the, the columns that way. So a lot of small indirections that it's easy to get lost in. <laughs> but now we can write code like this. Uh, iterate over the values with in, in the table uh, with the columns 0 and 3. Do a uh, destructuring to get them and, and print them like that. And that, that, is, that, that, that is that is cool. I mean, really, that, that is cool. Like so. Uh, yeah, so we have to do some extra gymnastics here to, to get the, uh, the columns in the table that the row refers to. And uh, also, we actually need a uh, copy like constructor that refers to different columns. Uh, and then we have get as before and tuple size, as, uh, as I showed you. So we can try this. So where do we get now? Ah, sorry. Thank you. Um, Row select, thank you. <laughs> now, I've, of course, ruin the history, so it's more difficult to see. Uh, 11 seconds compared to 11 seconds. Okay, it's the same. Uh, but the the nice thing here is. Uh, Actually, it isn't that very nice. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's more or less. Uh, yeah, but we, we can write our predicate by using select on the row. Uh, to get a, it's a little bit less uh, confused. But we, we have here, th this is uh, the, uh, the cool thing, that the found values, we say, no, give us just columns 0 and 3. Those are the ones. Uh, and print them. So now we have a reasonably convenient way to look at only some of the columns. Not quite there. <laughs> not quite there. But it, it's, it's not bad, I think. So yeah, this, this, is, this is cool. But I also want a conven convenient way to call functions with the selected elements, functions that are not functions of row, a function that takes two integers, for example. And I want to say, hey, I have a row with two integers. Call this function with those integers. So we have seen this before, how we can, we have this drop if that 
takes a lambda that takes a, a, a row, and we select column 0 and 2 and destructure it. So I can write a new select that takes a function and return a lambda. And when that lambda is called with a row, then we call f on, uh, on that subset. But this cost me a few hours because we have since before this uh, select that takes a, a, a row by constref. If it is called by a row as an R value reference or a non const reference, then this unconstrained select is a better match. And you get a very long, very confusing spew of compilation errors. What I would like to do here is to be able to constrain select and say that I want this to be callable only with f's that are themselves callable with rows. Some rows, but I don't know rows from which tables and which columns and which types. And I don't think that it is possible to make that kind of constraint. I, at least I haven't been able to figure it out. But I can do something I can do something that is, oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, okay, so th thank you, goodbye. <laughs> the, the, oh, okay. <laughs> Bomb diffused, yes. All right, so what I thought that I can do that is not as great, but it's at least a little less bad. Uh, I, can, I can check if something is a row. So I can say I have a row type, row type V, uh, that is, uh, it's false unless it is actually a row. Did you know that you can... Uh, do specialization of, of uh, template variables. That's nice. And then a, a concept saying this is a row type if the predicate row type V is, is true. So now I can just have a require saying that no, you may not be called with something that is a row. In this case, I have to remove the CV refs because uh, it can be anything. Uh, otherwise. And now it works. Now it actually works. So now I can write this code like so instead. Uh, value select zero, column zero and two with, with this lambda, which didn't really make things a lot better. But enter another helper function, uh, apply. Are, are you familiar with std apply? So std apply takes a function and a tuple and it calls the function with each of the elements of the tuple. So I want to do the same with a function and a row. But I want this to be a higher order function which uh, std apply is not. I want to say apply this function to get something that is callable with a row. And when it's called with a row we uh, we do the uh, do the call of the function which which each of the elements of that row so i return a lambda that captures the function and is callable with a row type and then do the, the get of each of the columns uh, in the in the row for the function trivial yeah the gray hairs. Uh, but then I can write this. Select column 0 and 2 and apply this lambda that takes order x, y, x and z. I, I don't have to do, uh, do any destructuring here. So that is nice. 
Except, does, does this look familiar? Isn't there a name for this? <laughs> Stood less, yeah. Speaking of standard thing, why don't you use a re a remove if instead of drop? Uh, you made your own drop if. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Why, 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 why did I write my own remove if uh, my own drop if when there exists uh, remove if? Uh, one f for two reasons. One, one that I just wanted to show how you do things. Uh, the other is because uh, <laughs> what does remove if do? Remove. Yes, it, it it keeps the order. It moves each and every element down one drop. Which, uh, which my drop if doesn't. It, it just says, take the last element, plop it into this position, and, and re forget the last one. So it, it changes it the order. Be a standard, unordered uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I heard something about uh, the papers. <laughs> what I mean, th this is. I am getting all the story eyed here. Th th this is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. Um, so let's have a look at this. I already forgot what a function select yeah. So now we can see here the range is with filter with select two and three of apply of the predicate that just takes a, a Z and D. Nice. Okay, same performance. So we didn't lose anything. We got more expressive code and we did not pay any runtime penalty for it. Although the code is kind of horrible the, the behind the behind the scenes, but the use of it is not horrible. It's it's easy to to work with. So now we have that and yes, I am all story story eyed I, I think this is uh, amazing the successometer pretty much bottomed out uh, if you think that this uh, is interesting you can I, I wrote a, an experimental library for this it's super experimental don't 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 use it for real <laughs> but 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 play with it by all means play with it uh, it yeah, yeah play, of course you play in production yeah. don't just don't uh, it has a few things uh, above what I have showed you today. For, for one, it actually respects const. That is kind of important. Uh, it does almost what you asked for. You can do select on types. So if, you, if you're using strong types, so each of the column is of, of a different type, then it's easy because you, you name the types with something that describes what they're for, and then it's easy. I actually did uh, experimentally some, for some time do uh, look up with uh, uh, NTTP, non-type non, non template parameter strings to give them actual names that you, you can write with uh, quotes. Uh, but I decided to drop that at least for now because it complicated the code a lot and there are other things I think are more important to work with. Uh, but if you're curious about that, by, by all means, have a look uh, and see what you can do. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the in, in my admittedly fairly limited uh, performance benchmarking, it, it shows the same results in the same benchmarks as the code that I showed you, despite having more functionality. And here are the sources for the 
examples that I showed you just now. And that was it. Thank you. Oh, I see some cameras. Sorry. <laughs> that is all I had to say. Thank you very much. So one of the uh, fun things with changing the arrangement of memory around is sometimes you don't know which one is faster. Yep. And the ideal, I think, would be to be able to change uh, the memory layout without having to touch the code at all. So in my mind, when I saw the, the first example, it had the, uh, it looked at all the Ds and it, it acted the same way on X, Y, Z. And that's pretty common sometimes, you know, X, Y, Z, if that's a position or something. Yeah. It, could, it would be pretty, this is like a feature request almost. <laughs> <laughs> So pull requests or, or accept yeah. it. <laughs> that not all, uh, that they're not all uh, arrays. That some of them should be sure. interlaced or interleaved or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, of course arrays I is uh, not at all. The, I, I expect in almost no use cases is, uh, is arrays the norm. Uh, well, that's true, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, what I mean is, um, in my mind, I think the first example would be a little bit faster if you had all the Ds next to each other, but the X, Y, Z, X, Y, yeah. Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Yeah, 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 but th that is up to you. You, you, you say that I, I want a table with these columns, and if you want to have all the Ds in one and X, Y, Z in, an in another, that's up to you. Mm, no, because then I would have to change the code if I change it around. Ah, uh, OK, yeah, OK. Um, so yeah, I, I think what you're asking for is magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no for, 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 yeah, for, for, for the recording, the, the, the question was if it would be possible to sort of essentially get the effect of having one, one column of Ds and one column of X, Y, Zs, but I would, wouldn't have to look at it that way. I would be able to just get my X, Y, Z and D. Uh, and to <laughs> maybe it is possible, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, to, to me, it sounds like magic. But on the other hand, before I started with this, uh, all of what I showed you today it looked like magic. So maybe it is possible. Uh, I think Mathieu had a, had a question. Yeah, I think somebody has one for me. OK. Um, Go ahead. Yep. Uh, did you try benchmarks with different data sizes, like way less, way more? I haven't really. I, uh, so the question is, have I done benchmarks with uh, different sizes uh, no i haven't really i because of time because of time constraints i felt that I, I have something that works and now i want to be able to to see if if i get the desired effect uh, and uh, my time has been limited it's been actually been pretty damn rushed to be able to to finish this to to be able to to present now so i'm sorry i haven't uh, it, that would be nice actually it would also be super nice to to do a com comparative benchmarks with uh, uh, other e ECS libraries, but I, I haven't had time to go there. Uh, now it's you, Mathieu. Uh, I haven't seen anything about ID reuse, because uh, the problem with data structure yep. Yep. is usually ID reuse actually doesn't yep. Yes, uh, it, good that you mentioned this. This uh, experimental library that I said uh, does use uh, the uh, the row ID as uh, the the index in in the, the offset in the index column and a generation that, that changes. So even if you reuse the, the same slot, it's not the same row ID. So thank you for that. Yes. No, you would, uh, okay, the question is, would, do, does this uh, affect with uh, <coughs> dropping by moving the last element uh, into the row that you removed, would, would that go against the idea of fast contiguous iteration? No, it doesn't, because the iterators go by offset, they do not go by row ID. If they did go by row ID, you, you would jump all over the place and it would be ter terrible. Okay, so you always iterate by basically the base of Yes, 
yes, you always you always go in strictly increasing address order when but you iterate. Maintaining the, the lookup. No, the not maintaining the lookup order. So so itera not iteration. It, it, iteration is in storage order. To to get. But you you, sa you said you had two arrays or vectors that you maintained. Yeah. Of row yeah. ID to index. Yes. To index row ID. Yes. If you have to touch those. Yeah. For every yeah, but you. So the, the question is, uh, since I do have these uh, row IDs, r the index and the reverse index to for the row IDs, if I have to touch those in iteration, then, b d then performance will, uh, will suffer. But I don't. I don't touch those. I iterate strictly over the, uh, over the data vectors so only. You drop it, you move things around. Yes. We, which means we d we <laughs> the drop if will do so, but the iteration will not. The iteration is just going strictly in storage order, but when, sure, when, when you make a change, when, when, when you remove an element, then yes, you, you do change the order and then you have to update the, the index, which, which you saw in this example that performance actually suffered, not, not hugely, but measurably. Would it break if I had a table in a table? Uh, I, I don't think so, but I haven't actually tried it. Because the... Uh, the you forbid anything that's a row, that's a row, and like a table has a row, and like a table in a table. Uh, yeah, but the, the, the rows are unique per table type. So the, the row type is unique to the table. So I don't think that is a problem. Uh, there was someone else. Yes? Yes, so I'm not trying to make you do more work. <laughs> I'm, I use one C++26 feature in the slides, not in the code. <laughs> so, uh, and the re reflection has not been accepted into the standard yet. I have only showed things that have been formally uh, accepted. Unless uh, they were actually accepted. The reflection actually was uh, accepted just a few weeks ago at the last uh, standardization meeting. But I, don't, I haven't heard about that, so I don't think so. Okay, you can go home now. <laughs> <laughs>